Scott Rideshell. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys. On the line next, I've got the great Andrew Coburn. He is the author of a great many books, including his most recent, The Spoils of War. And he is the Washington editor of Harper's Magazine. And if I can find the right link here... It is spoilsofwar.substack.com, where he has this incredible recent piece, Our Real National Security Budget, $2 trillion. Here we come. Welcome back to the show, Andrew. How are you doing? Oh, great to be with you. I'm um, pretty good. Pretty good. Good. Very happy to have you on the show here. Before I start asking you questions about this great article slash interview of Winslow Wheeler that you have here, I wanted to thank you for granting... Your uh, Pierre Spray Award to the great Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com. I think that's really great that you guys recognized his great work there. Oh, I guess he got second place after the great Max Blumenthal, but still. Yeah. Oh, no, we were so happy to do that. I mean, we're so impressed with uh, with what Dave puts out. I mean, uh, ama amazing quantity and always high quality tells you what you need to know. I mean, I said, I said at the ceremony and i said well start your day with antiwar.com <laughs> then if you feel like it follow up with the uh trashy old legacy media yeah absolutely right there well and and i think that's great and of course i am the world's largest and biggest and greatest gareth porter fan and so uh, i'm very happy to see that he won the runner-up prize as well and of course the great max blumenthal who got first place he don't work for me, but and and he's not my greatest friend like Gareth Porter, but I love the guy. I've interviewed him a hundred times, and he has done such great work this year, especially debunking the Israelis' narratives about October the 7th and so forth. So he absolutely deserved to win first place there, and very happy to see that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, cool, man. Yeah. It's nice when there's something nice to talk about, Andrew. You know what I mean? <laughs> doesn't happen that often these days, but uh, we should seize the opportunity when we can. Seriously. All right. So everybody knows that the national defense budget is only 800 and something billion dollars a year. So what's with this crazy headline of yours here? Well, you know, that they um, they are very careful to, I mean, this, the uh, number is still obscenely large, but they're sort of careful to leave out all sorts of very relevant national security activities. Um, and as we try to point out that the real number, if you count in, you know, everything that your dollar and taxpayer dollar and mine goes to for the cause of national security, we're heading towards two trillion. I mean, we're in 17, uh, 1 trillion point 767 right now and rising sharply. Amazing. So help walk us through this. How do we get from 800 billion to almost another trillion on top of that? Well, um, so the problem is that they, you know, they, as I say, they leave out a lot of stuff. Um, things like the amount we spend on nuclear weapons, uh, you know, nuclear warheads, the bombs, the newer bombs, the bigger bombs, the smaller bombs, and that funneled through the Department of Energy. And that comes to $37 billion, not a, not a small sum. Then um, there's, well, like $26 billion for military pensions and health care, which is, you know, again, if we, you know, very obviously per, very pertinently part of it. Another $12 billion for the uh, selective service operation. And then, as um, you know, as Winslow Wheeler points out, there's something very mysterious. There's a sus suspicious-looking category for the international activities, the FBI, which they refuse to tell us what that is. It's just lumped under 
defense related activities. So, and then I, you know, going on down the list, um, there's a huge chunk for the money we pay to, you know, the, the interest on the debt for the money, the, the debt that we borrowed, the money we borrowed to finance all this in the first place. So that comes to $254 billion. So once you start adding it all up, you're, as I say, we're heading for $2 trillion. Yeah, it's amazing. And then, of course, there's also, as you guys talk about in the piece here, you and Winslow Wheeler, you have this uh, kind of separate war budget. So if we give billions of dollars to Israel, to Ukraine, to Taiwan, to whoever, that doesn't get counted in the original defense budget, right? Right. That's when they, you know, they've announced this budget. And then what's going to happen is they'll tack on things um, as needs be for Israel, for Ukraine, for Taiwan, for something called the defense industrial base, which is a lot of money handed out to corporations to build to build plants to you know step up mm. um production facilities for artillery shells or whatever yeah so yeah they've been able to present this year they say oh look we're spending less this year we're projected to spend less actually for next year which is the budget we're talking about uh than we did this year but that's only that's just sleight of hand because by the time they've tossed in all these other ingredients, it'll be higher. Yeah. And of course, killing Somalis is expensive. They've been doing that since 2001. Lord knows the total spent on killing those poor people, but there's a war that has no end in sight. That's right. And then the, you know, the ongoing wars in, um, in the Sahel, in the Sahel, you know, in the Sahara region, mm -hmm. um, you'll note we've just been kicked out of Niger uh, where we had a huge drone base, which we spent a hundred million dollars on, and now we're proposing to instead shift to uh, um, other places like Ghana or along the West African coast, because you know we got to keep keep those keep those drones flying. Yeah, I, I wasn't able to reach him, but Nick Terse had a piece recently about how terrorism in northern and western Africa has increased some thousands of percents since the war on terrorism there, especially we all know it was Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's mass murder of the Libyans in 2011 that really kicked it all off there. So the jihadists then, who they sided with, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group and Ansar al-Sharia and the others then spread down into Mali and made their alliance with Boko Haram in Nigeria and God knows what. Yeah, you know, it's, um, I'm so glad you, you know, Nick Terse is just fantastic in sort of covering that part of the world, which most you hard to find, you know, that kind of reporting anywhere else. And, you know, we often hear about, well, it's often said, you know, rightly that, um, you know, that Iraq, the invasion of Iraq was the greatest strategic blunder of the, of recent decades. But, um, the more I think about it, you know, the casual destruction of Libya really is up there with, for reasons you've just said, you know, it's really kicked off something that's good. That's, that's causing the whole of, uh, Northwestern Africa to, uh, you know, to spin into a jihadist nightmare. Yeah. Well, hey, it's good for business if you're in the business of spreading conflicts <laughs> and then promising to clean them up and spreading them further, which is yeah. the racket, right? The self-licking ice cream cone. Well, that's right. Um, you know, and as, as, as I say, it's great for business. Um, you know, Pierre Spray, who we honored at the, uh, you know, that that award with, <clears throat> we, we, you were talking about for, for Max and Gareth and Dave, he always, one of his many wise sayings was that the U.S. government has two functions, to buy arms at home and sell arms abroad. Um, you know, and the war on terror continues to be the gift, is the gift that keeps on giving in that regard. Yeah. You know, hadn't it been amazing just in the last even half a year to see how, I mean, they must have decided this at some White House meeting or something, right? That they are going to go ahead and put subsidies for the military industrial complex as one of the top publicly stated reasons for intervening in the Ukraine and Russia war. I know. I mean, um, 
you could make this. <laughs> we could have, you know, come to that conclusion ourselves. In fact, we have. But um, the fact that they actually boast about it, you know, shows how sort of clunky they are. That Blinken and you know and Biden himself, you know, say, oh, most of this money, the money for Ukraine, is really going to be spent here. So uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's we're giving it to you, giving it to the, yeah. i.e., the military-industrial complex. We're out of excuses. Here's a bribe. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Please believe that <laughs> yeah, you but... are somehow going to benefit from us cashing a check for Raytheon here, if, even if you don't work for Raytheon. Somehow this benefits you. Just. Close your eyes real tight and believe it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's astonishing, really. I mean, um, it, sort of bra the sort of mutton-headed brazenness of this is is at least in the old days they used to pretend it was for you know I don't know democracy or something, yeah. <laughs> and now just to sort of openly state you know um, that this is this is a bribe, this is a bribe to our corporate pals. Um, with maybe a few jobs thrown in at, yeah. um, on the side. Um, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And, geez, think of all the doctors and nurses getting paid to take care of the permanently maimed and warehoused in Walter Reed and the other military hospitals, Andrew. There's a great stimulus for your city, huh? Well, that's right, yeah. I mean, you know, um, and you know, veterans affairs. By the way, that's eight hundred billion in the budget we were just talking about. Um, so the, you know, we just to look after the uh, the people who've been <clears throat> who've uh, been part of this. You know, the the endless war. I mean, that's a huge item in the budget that we uh, and you know, particularly the the poor people who men and women who've been maimed in the process and who. Uh, Sitting there, lingering in Walter Reed and other uh, other establishments like that. Yeah, I mean, they really are out of sight, out of mind. Nobody talks about them. Everybody wants to pretend the terror war never happened. Now, I guess, and so all those guys that got their legs blown off and worse, you know, maimed. And it's a great, you know, benefit. It's wonderful that. Battlefield medicine has advanced so much that so many of these guys' lives were saved when they otherwise would have died out there in the field. At the same time, you know, the the dark lining on that bright cloud is the massive expense of them being forced to live the rest of their miserable lives in bed in the hospital, maybe well, for decades. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's horrible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they... There has to be, you know, the their relatives, you know, I, I know this from someone who's directly involved in helping them. I mean, the, the people come in from, um, you know, their families come from around the country to visit their, you know, ailing, you know, their, their wounded relative, father, brother, son um, in Walter Reed. Um, and the, it has to be private. They depend on private charity for their sustenance. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> I think if we're going to spend eight hundred, if among that money, we should at least be looking after the families of these people too. Right. Yeah, they got to have the Ronald McDonald House put them up for the weekend or whatever. Yeah. Um, I wonder when was the last time George W. Bush visited Walter Reed or Barack Hussein Obama. I bet oh, never. Great question. I've, you know, I've never seen any years. sign that they ever have. Yeah, no, they don't care Bush, at all about those people. Not one uh, bit. Bush sort of, he started painting. He took up painting in his old age and uh, was, has taken it up. And he's painted, he, he was painting wounded veterans, um, <laughs> which I thought was kind of, in a way, kind of, kind of weird or kind of sick in a way. I mean, he gets all these poor people maimed. And then he, you know, gets to paint their picture. Yeah. And then I think, you know, they must screen the guys, too, when he does meet with them or has in the past met with them. It's always some guy who's very happy to have a chance to go and take a walk or ride a bike with W. Bush. It's never a veteran who in any way regrets the sacrifice that he was tricked into making there in the name of defending this country. And it's always oh, like, that's... oh, geez, I got to hang out with W. Bush for the day. That was nice. You know, right. As opposed to, <laughs> I had the opportunity to punch <laughs> W. Bush in the nose. Yeah. Uh, or even just tell him, hey, man, what you did 
the lies you told, the sacrifices me and my buddies were forced to make, you know, nothing like that. He's never confronted with that ever, you know? No, no. And, you know, it's all fading from memory. I mean, all that, that disaster. And, um, as we just said, they were just discussing the, you know, the ongoing disaster or among the other ongoing disasters, you know, the whole Libyan, uh, I mean, the Libyan tragedy, what they did there, which is, um, you know, has had the ramifications are just extraordinary and horrible. Mm -hmm. Well, and the entire terror war, the cost was borrowed. Uh, I mean, the, the money that wasn't just, you know, printed up and, and you know, uh, stolen from us through inflation. They borrowed it from China and Korea and Japan. And so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to pay interest on that debt forever. I mean, the way I look at it, I, I think I saw that, you know, it's more than a trillion dollars a year just in interest on the debt right now. So the way I look at it, that's every cent I've ever paid to the IRS ever has just gone to pay interest on the debt to some foreign sovereign central bank that of course also printed the money to buy the american securities in the first place and that's yep. just all of our wealth just think about all the money that you have paid in income tax that you otherwise would have spent improving the life of your family that they just piss away on this violence and then that just the interest on the debt for the violence it's just sickening well yes um it is and there's no you know, um, as we as I discussed in that uh, interview with uh, uh, with Winslow Wheeler, you know that there's no um, there's no dissent on this in in the Congress. I mean, you and I and you know millions of people in this country do think it's, it is sick. It's disgusting, but the you know it's just gets waved through the Congress. And an important part of to under, thing to understand is the Congress now is so tightly controlled by the party leadership, by, you know, Schumer and McConnell in the Senate and uh, uh, Johnson in, in the House, but certainly in the Senate, you can't, if you're a senator and you say, hey, I don't think we should be spending money, you know, I'm going to introduce an amendment to say we should not give any more money for, I don't know, killing Somalis or whatever. Um, that amendment doesn't go anywhere unless Schumer decides or McConnell decides it can be brought to the floor. Um, there's absolutely no no possibility anymore for real debate in the Senate unless, well, particularly Schumer uh, decides it should be so. So, you know, democracy has been really eroded there. Yeah. Hey, you guys, did you know that I don't just write books? I publish them. Well, the Institute does, and I'm the director, so yeah. Thirteen of them now, including my four. We published five more in 2023. Lori Calhoun and Tom Woods' books about the COVID regime. Joe Solis Mullen on the fake China threat. Jim Bovard's latest, Last Rights. And our managing editor, Keith Knight's, Domestic Imperialism. And we've got more great titles coming in 2024. Check them out at libertarianinstitute.org slash books and help support our anti-government efforts at libertarianinstitute.org slash donate. And thank you. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Let me tell you about Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Who knew? Artificial bank credit expansion leads to price inflation and terribly distorted markets. If you've got any savings left at all, you need to protect them. You need to put some, at least, into precious metals. Well, Roberts and Roberts can set you up with the best deals on silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. And they've been doing this since 1977. Hey, if you just need some sound advice about sound money, they're there for you too. Call Tim Fry and the guys at 800-874-9760. That's 800-874-9760. Or check them out at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. You'll be glad you did. I saw the funniest thing when Schumer criticized Netanyahu and the Likud party said, this is not a banana republic. We are a sovereign and independent nation. I thought, fine, then give me back my half a trillion dollars you stole and kill those people with your own bombs and ammunition and leave my country out of your deadly sin. How about that? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of, I mean uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was what you'd expect from... Uh, Netanyahu and the Likud, but I thought the 
the Schumer speech, you know, it um, it was you see to me it was really designed to do was to present a sort of um, a little ex- a few excuses for the for to Democratic voters who are going to desert the party uh, because of Gaza to say it's another effort to sort of say um, a fig leaf to say hey we're really you know we're standing up for the Palestinians too we're criticizing Netanyahu uh, you know we're trying to we really want to put in humanitarian aid to Gaza you know but in reality why we still send all the bombs and bombs and shells and ammunition to kill more Palestinians it's all part of this PR drive that's going on right now to um, somehow uh, persuade all those Democrats who are going to not vote in November or vote somehow vote against Biden that, hey, you know, we're not really as bad as it looks and we're trying to do something about the genocide, which they're not. Yeah. Man, I remember reading this thing. You guys mentioned the submarines in here. And I think it was Greg Palast about 10 years ago had a thing where I forgot the exact total. Maybe they were charging... Uh, 10 billion uh, for each sub and then but they had ordered 20 subs and then they cut the order to 10 but then they just doubled the price of each sub so they got the same amount of money for half the amount of submarines yeah by the way let's hear it for the submarine service you know um, that they've now run the cost of a uh, Columbia the new missile sub the Columbia class it now costs more than an aircraft carrier. I mean, it's wow. a pretty significant, significant achievement to actually have a submarine cost more than a an aircraft carrier with thousands of sailors on board and you know huge complex systems. I mean, a submarine's pretty a missile sub is pretty complicated too. But I've just that's real a real budgetary triumph, and they should be recognised for their achievement. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if this really goes without saying, but. All this wealth, I mean, you know, as they were talking about before, they spin this as, you know, a benefit for your county or whatever. All this comes from us in the first place through our taxes, the price we pay through the penalty of inflation, the interest on the debt that we have to pay when they borrow from China to, you know, attack Afghanistan or whatever crazy thing to build up Taiwan. Um, All this comes at our expense. And if we just abolish the empire... We would all be so much wealthier. They act like, oh, American American industry would just fall apart if it wasn't for all this welfare. But this is all at the expense of the productive economy. Well, that's right. And it's a it's a sign of how so hollowed out in a way the economy is. Um, I just had a piece in um, in Harper's uh about how Silicon Valley is sort of becoming ever more tight, entering into an ever more close embrace with the military industrial complex. You know, Silicon Valley, which, you know, used to be, you know, thought of as, you know, hey, part of a sort of techno counterculture, you know, the personal computer liberated us and so forth. And really now more and more, the, the sort of the whole impetus in the tech industry is towards defense contracts. Um, And that's a sign to me that really they run out of ideas for sort of civilian innovation, for, um, you know, ways to not be part of the military industrial complex. So it's it's just like, um, you know, once upon a time, the US machine tool industry dominated the world and it was incredibly productive and efficient and paid high wages and had very good cost control and so forth. And then they discovered the defense dollar and, you know, it's got fat on defense contracts. And but in the meantime, the Germans and the Japanese and maybe ultimately the Chinese you know, they were they were starting to produce better machine tools, um, you know, better priced and you know more productively produced, and so that basically the um, our machine tool industry sort of fell gradually more and more by the wayside. It's just, you know, as we are sort of manufacturing capabilities wither away, you know, that they turn to just leeching off 
well, as you say, you and me in the end, <laughs> you know, government contracts. And that's what's happening with tech, too, mm-hmm. I think. And then they point their finger at China and go, oh, the Chinese, they're undermining us. They're our enemy. And it's like, yeah, you blew our brains out. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, God. Yeah, man. So, um, you know, I'm real short on time here today, but I wanted to give you a chance to uh, mention Julian Assange. I know you've written quite a bit about this, and of course, he's up against the wall right now. We're waiting to find out, I think, the final ruling on whether he'll be extradited to the United States to be locked in a dungeon next to Ramsey Youssef, who actually deserves to be there in this Supermax in uh, Florence, Colorado. So I was wondering, you know what? I'm sure this is something that you come up against from time to time as well, that as time goes on, you have all new audiences coming in, people who were too young before or they were on the other side before or they just don't really, maybe they only recently started paying attention to current events and foreign policy and these kinds of things. Who is Julian Assange, Andrew, and why should anybody care? Well, first of all, Julian Assange is... The most, well, the most, one of the most important journalists, uh, purveyors of truth, um, we've had in decades, um, in the world, um, certainly, you know, in in this country, because he released, he w- was able to obtain and released um, crucial information about the way our national security state operates and particularly how they were fighting the wars in um, Afghanistan and Iraq, including the information they were concealing about the war crimes they were committing, mowing down civilians in the streets of Baghdad and journalists in the streets of Baghdad. And for that, he's been relentlessly pursued by the uh, national security state in this country. I mean, I believe they've been... They've been trying to frame him, trying to get him since, you know, for the last 13 years. <clears throat> and, you know, they concocted a, a fake rape accusation charge in Sweden um, so as to, um, with the hopes of hauling him back to Sweden and then they could send him on here to be tried. He was able to hold that up. And that was being done with the acquies- uh, acquiescence of the British British state. Uh, Julian sort of frustrated that for some years by at the cost of holding himself up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, Um, eventually having um, suborned the Ecuadorian state, the British police came in and hauled them out, threw him in a horrible prison called Belmarsh in London, which is called rightly the British Guantanamo. And they've left him there while they pursue the legal process to extradite him back to this country. But I think really in the hopes he'll die in prison, his health is terrible. Um, so well, it's a, And one of the many disgusting and shocking aspects of the whole case is the silence of the media here. I mean, here's a guy who produced a lot of material for them that they use, the New York Times uh, particularly. Um, but once he, you know, was shown how, you know, that he was, you know, once they'd used that, um, they abandoned him and left him to his fate. There's been no, you know, concerted campaign in the mainstream media here to, at this outrage that a journalist is being persecuted in this way. And it's kind of blind on their part because what makes them think with the shredding of the First Amendment this represents that they're not going to be next. But no, they just want to stay in, you know, good odor with the, with the the people they really represent. So it's it's an everyone. I'm, you know, any young person who hasn't heard about it before, has to understand this is a crucially important case, and people should, you know, call their congressman or do whatever to try and protest this and bring some pressure against this persecution. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I just finished talking with um, Michael Tracy about the new bill to ban TikTok yeah. and uh, the danger to free speech that that represents. And now here, just breaking in the Washington Times, Supreme Court worries about limiting Fed's interactions with social media companies. And this is, you know, from the Twitter files cases going to the Supreme Court and uh, 
Justice Ketanji, Ketanji Brown says, your view has the First Amendment hamstringing the government in significant ways in the most important time periods. I'm really worried about that. And these Isn't people that, are yeah, traitors I mean, to America. Uh, you just you feel like giving up or throwing up. It's like when, you know, um, uh, Matt Taibbi uh, was uh, in front of the House, uh, House hearing and all the Democrats yelled at him for it was the liberal Democrats on the panel, like, you know, Congressman Allred is now running for the Senate in Texas, you know, shouting at him, saying, you're not a journalist, so-called journalist. Um, it's just I'm sort of I guess I shouldn't be shocked in my old age that the liberal Democrats are like so, <laughs> so keen to shred the First Amendment like this, but they clearly are. And, I mean, here they quote some of the conservative justices, Thomas, Alito, um, and Kavanaugh, express some skepticism. But these are the people who, by default, are much more inclined to side with the state than the liberals on First Amendment issues. But I guess it's just partisanship Uber Alice here, but, or, or hopefully, right? Um, because without that, then... They'll just join with the liberals to destroy the First Amendment once and for all. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. This is a you really have to realign your sort of political classifications like um, uh, at the State of the Union, uh, Congressman Massey, Thomas Massey, uh, he had Julian Assange's brother, Gabriel Shipton, uh, sitting beside him, you know, as, as, a, as an honored guest. I didn't see much coverage of that given to, <laughs> in the reports on the speech, but they, uh, yeah, it was a noble effort. Actually, there's quite a few, there is a little sort of congressional movement, I don't know if you can call it a caucus, you know, protesting at the treatment of Assange, which is bipartisan, you know, you have uh, like Massey, who's considered normally, you know, or is a conservative Republican, um, you know, Ray McGovern, who's a liberal Democrat. So there are a few honorable figures who, you know, see this for what it is, but, you know, they're very much in the minority. Yeah, man, it's really too bad. And, you know, because of partisanship, it's so hard to build the real consensus of, you know, of the American people that we just absolutely won't tolerate this. Maybe we will, you know? I don't know. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's being shredded. They, um, I mean, the control, obviously, you know, what happened you know, there's been a concerted effort. The internet sort of got out of control for a while and there were all sorts of things, you know, information freely available to people, um, which caused people to, you know, go in directions that the establishment didn't care for. And there's, you know, there's been this concerted effort to bring the inter uh, social media, the, by which I guess what the where were they worried about with the internet bring social media under control and the whole um you know what the, that's what the twitter files uh, revealed i mean thank goodness mr musk for a brief moment at least was prepared to uh, for whatever reason to let that happen uh to re, you know release what twitter had been doing in terms of cooperating with the government with the fbi uh, to suppress free speech um, but I, you know, I have the worst forebodings, especially this horrifying statement by the, you know, beloved liberal justice, Katanji, Katanji Brown, um, saying, you know, <laughs> the, the government being hamstrung by the first amendment. Isn't that, um, I mean, that whirring sound must be Thomas Jefferson or James Madison whirring in their graves, but, uh, Seriously. that's where we are. Yeah, it's just amazing that she could even utter something like that out of her own mouth and not think, oh, what the hell am I saying? <laughs> That's what the First Amendment... How about, am I allowed to choose my church? Are you going to figure that out for me too, lady, huh? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, right, right, yeah, exactly. Uh, if the First Amendment doesn't mean what it says, and I guess they can just outlaw, I don't know, Presbyterians. I hear they're pretty soft on supporting Israel. Oh yeah, that yeah, they 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 better watch out. They'll they'll be in the lineup. Uh, um, yeah, there's even a few Baptists around the world who around the place who uh, maybe might be considered undependable. Mm. Yeah, can't have very, that. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really feel like, you know, we're being boiled like frogs, you know. It's, yeah. uh, and that's the thing about the Supreme Court is like, if they want, they can stand up against the Congress and the president and strike their unconstitutional laws down. But if they wish to uphold them, that's it. We're screwed. Yep, that's it. It's all over. They got the monopoly on deciding. So yeah. the Constitution either says what it says or it don't. And probably more than half the time it don't. <laughs> <laughs> man. Grim thought, indeed. Yeah, man. All right. Well, listen, I am uh, so happy to have you back on the show and go over these great articles with you, uh, Andrew. I hope everyone will run out and get the book Spoils of War. And that's also the Substack, spoilsofwar.substack.com for our real national security budget. And then also check out harpers.org for the latest here, the Pentagon's Silicon Valley problem, how big tech is losing the wars of the future. Thanks so much for your time, man. Thank you, Scott. Take care. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.